Thanks, Thank Jacqueline. You. Yeah. And hi, I'm, I'm Ted Youngs with Quintado Medical. Um, I'm our director of strategy. I come from a user experience background in terms of building uh, digital experiences, um, particularly for the consumer market and, and now in medical. Um, Kareem is the CEO of our company and has like 20 plus years experience in the medical space. Um, we're our, another colleague of ours, Tony, uh, who is one of the founders has worked specifically in the cardiology and electrophysiology space for the better part of a decade. And so it's really in partnership with her that we've um, started to pick away at some of the issues um, that happen medically around cardiology and particularly electrophysiology that uh, we're gonna look at a little further today. So again, we're Contato Medical. Um, we think of ourselves as the only comprehensive cardiology platform for the care of patients with implantable cardiac devices. Um, I wanted to just start with um, a story that we've heard from one patient about their uh, clinical experience with having um, an implantable cardiac device. Um, in general, uh, for those who aren't aware or aren't aware, an ICD can serve a couple different um, uh, a couple different purposes. It it you know it sits under your skin for your life. Um, it's there to monitor your heart well being and. They're almost always now connected into a, a service that drives content on a regular basis back into the clinic. So um, if your heart is beating too fast or out of rhythm, uh, your clinician should be able to be aware of that, not necessarily in real time, but um, for subsequent follow-up. Um, for this individual I'm referring to here who's been kind of de-identified, um, they, they had a condition where their heart was racing at 170 beats a minute um, and they had no reset on their defibrillator. Their heart didn't change. They ended up having to go and visit the emergency room. Um, and from their understanding of their heart condition, they thought things would probably reset on their own. They also thought that the clinic would come and, you know, give them a call or help them. Um, and subsequently, I mean, the, thankfully they went to the ER um, they were able to be shocked and AFib and, and their heart went back to a regular ry rhythm. And when they went into their clinic subsequently, the clinic was unaware um, that anything had taken place. Um, and so that this is a sort of um, classic care problem that's taking place in this space is that um, there's, a, there's a delta between the promise of the technology and the experience that um, that the individuals are having with it. And by extension, there are a lot of issues within the clinic in terms of just having the appropriate workflows and being able to successfully manage the patients that are there. Um, so in the context of this patient, I mean, currently in the United States, it's estimated that somewhere in the range of one out of every hundred Americans is walking around with some kind of um, cardiac device, a pacemaker, a loop, a loop recorder, or, or a defibrillator. So it's a, it's a really, um, significant, significant population. Um, as we started to attack this space, um, we had some, we had some resistance and I'll let Claire or, or Kareem speak, um, speak to speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. This is one of the things that was really interesting. You know, we, we start to see the, the this problem. Um, we're, we're understanding this problem a little further and we, we first, uh, approached our, our, our partners, Virginia Mason, and, and said, hey, we'd like to talk to you about, about your, um, your cardiac implant clinic. And, and, um, and uh, we have a, an idea for a platform that we think could really make the process just way more integrated, way more efficient. And, and the response we received was, what, you know, we're making a million dollars a year out of this clinic why would we want to spend the time to go through this process with you? And it wasn't that they were mercenary in their, in, in their approach, but it was, that was just a proxy for saying the system is functional. Why do we want to disrupt the system? Right. And this is, this is um, one of the things challenges we, we run into is that the problems that, that are masked by whatever a, a simplistic sort of view on, on the system are myriad. And, and one of the first things that we come across is, is that um, there is a, about 15% of the, uh, of the patients that were under the care, the umbrella of, of this organization, were either 
in a, in a backlog, meaning the alerts hadn't been fully processed, or they were what's called lost to follow up. And for the, any of those of you that are, that are familiar with the space, I'm, I'm, we're trying to use language that's, that makes it easy for you, um, for those that may not be experts in the space. So forgive me if I'm, I'm being a little pedantic. But these 15% these of their patients, these are patients that, that basically, they don't know what their current status is, maybe because um, their devices has run out of batteries or the, the, um, the, the network device on their bedside table isn't turned on, whatever reason but the clinic doesn't know what their current status is or hasn't, hasn't processed an alert from, from their device. So that was, that's an issue, right? There's risk for the clinic embedded in there. The next thing that we, that we realized was that they, had, uh, they, they actually had eight FTE dedicated against, this, uh, against this, this function. And these caregivers though, they really, they only had six positions filled and they consistently were not able to fill the, all of the, the positions, um, which that meant for those six, those six uh, caregivers, they were actually at 112% of capacity. So all of the alerts that were coming in, they were not able to process those all in a day. So it, their entire day was spent entirely with the administration of this process, six FTE, entirely administration. And then the last thing, I, I alluded to this before, but it wasn't just that they were, they couldn't hire, they couldn't fill those last two positions, but they consistently had a very high turnover in the role. So what, what you're seeing is, it, it, what you're seeing here is the manifestation of a broken system, right? And you could see if outwardly, if you're an administrator and you're looking at this without knowing the specifics, you might say, you know what, that system's working fine. There's a million dollars of revenue coming in, but these numbers tell you there are humongous costs attached to this system that's not functioning properly, whether it's downside risk, whether it's the cost of attrition, or it's, it's even just job satisfaction and patient care, right? There, there's a lot buried in here. Great, yeah, so we set out considering the, the question of remotes and considering the fact that this device is part of your life for your life and to try to create uh, a holistic uh, platform for dealing with cardiology and implantable devices on a single platform. Um, so it's really the entirety of that cardiological workflow um, for, a populate, for this population and the devices. And so, you know, traditionally parts of the population have been um, have been ignored or left behind, as as Kareem was mentioning before. Um, so we're trying to figure out how can how can we create the workflows and the cues where people aren't forgotten and lost, and then by extension, how are we uh, to this point of 112 percent of capacity? How can we establish when someone's heart condition um, is really important with all the individual data? What what are the ones that really matter? Who is the individual in distress? Who is the individual that we can just clear? We'll say they're okay and move on. And so um, Cantado was, was very much developed with um, creating workflows around optimizing that process in mind um, and bringing it all into a singular platform. Um, the other thing that became very clear, clear to us, and again, this is life of patient, life of device, is that the interactions you have as an individual with an implantable cardiac device um, they go, they live for your life. They have um, specific activities that take place in the clinic. They also have activities that may take place in a hospital. So you're first the point where you're implanted uh, or if you go in and get say, for example, a knee replacement, um, you will need to be put under and you will need to be brought back out. At both those points, your ICD needs to be turned off and turned back on and monitoring expressing that those things have been done correctly is both, um, you know, like, the best possible patient care reduces all liability and creates clarity in the entire system about about an individual's well-being and then also bringing to the platform the question of remotes as we mentioned before how are we taking all this cardiological data that's being passed through from individuals and this is particularly relevant in an alaskan context where someone can be in fairbanks as they can be in the brooks range providing data and they may be you know whatever, 200 miles uh, from a clinic, but they're still very much able to be providing data into that, into the, into the clinical setting for the clinician and for them to have confidence in their health. 
And so um, I'll just yeah, just to build on that really quickly, yeah. I was going to mention there are two clinics. There are two Virginia Mason affiliated clinics in, in Alaska, I believe, in Juno in Anchorage. Is that right, Ted? Or uh, Juno, uh, and, uh, Juno and uh, Sitka. 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 Sorry. Um, so there are there are patients there are patients there that are that fall under this umbrella. Anyway, so sorry, I digress. Yeah, there. I mean, there are patients in Alaska currently. I mean, it's a small percentage of the global cohort from Virginia Mason, but that are um, being that, whose well-being is being managed through through the platform today. Um, and broadly, Kareem can speak to the result. We've been uh, live with Virginia Mason now for the better part of a year, and we so we have a good sense of the data in terms of um, the impacts on well-being and uh, for both clinicians and and for patients. So Kareem can speak to that a little. Yeah, for sure. The first thing um, those that 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 the patients that previously were in part of a backlog or in loss to follow. They're no longer lost, right? And that's that that's profound for a couple of reasons, not just from a care standpoint, but let let's, I mean, not, not to be just hyper pragmatic about this, but there's a lot of risk attached to that. I mean, it, as you can imagine, for um, you know, a care system, if they've got patients that they they are outwardly monitoring that then um, have an adverse event and it and you know, you're 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 responsible for them. Um, there's risk there, right? There's 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 financial risk, potential liability attached to that. So that that was a big deal. Um, the next thing that we were able to accomplish um, was an actual uh, a 10x increase in efficiency. I meaning a process that took that took 45 minutes in the past to process each one of these alerts actually now takes less than five. And so that that increase in efficiency um, made it so that. Uh, Ted was just talking about like finding out what's most important, being able to work through the the, the most important alerts first um, is now feasible, right? Because and to this last point, really a small percentage of the uh, of the day now for the FTE, um, a small percentage of their day is actually uh, attached to this ad admin function. So now you have rather than six um, caregivers. That are at 112 percent of their of their daily capacity, creating a backlog every day because they're not unable to get to their work. Virginia Mason's been able to to actually deck two FTE against this, and they are done by 10 a.m. And so they're only 25 percent of their time is actually spent on this. Let's call it administrivia. Now that being said, I'll, I'll even go and this. I, I can't say enough good things not about Virginia Mason as a co-development partner, but. Uh, but even the people at, as from the technological partner stand, uh, standpoint, but their, their vision is not to just optimize for cost. Like they could easily have one individual process all of these, these alerts and they would still have some, some care remaining, but they see the value in being able to say, hey, we want these, these caregivers to actually spend time giving care. And that's what they that's what they got into the into the industry for, and that's what they're trained for. So let's allow now that we've allowed the machines to take on a lot of the sort of data handling work. Let's allow the humans to actually do what they do best, which is provide care. So this this elaborate <laughs> this 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 is a long way of saying we're data plumbers who partnered with with people that very much experienced firsthand the problem within this within this space. And we were able to have all the lifting performed by the by the machines specifically so that we could have this this better patient care outcome. And I'll just uh, we'll end here and take questions, but with just a quote from one of our partners at Virginia Mason, the, the original individual who told us, hey, we're making a million million dollars, you know, leave us alone. I don't think he said leave us alone, but some not, words to that effect. So working with Cantata, we partnered to build a, uh, a solution from the ground up that allowed us the right mix of software and workflow to deliver an efficient process for prioritizing our clinical workday that also ensures optimal billing and increased staff satisfaction. Um, and he, as because he's still on the tech side, he doesn't actually necessarily mention the improvement in quality to patient care, but we know that's there too. Um, <laughs> So we, I mean, we appreciate your being uh, here with us. We'd love, I don't know, um, questions, comments, what would, 
First of all, let me ask my audience to give you a, a virtual or real uh, round of applause. Thank you so much. I, it's, it's hard to uh, really share these really complex subjects and you've done an excellent job of um, telling us about the problem that you're solving. So thank okay. you very much for that. Um, for, the first thing that I'd like to say is that what I love about what you're doing is you are solving a problem that most people would never see and yet clearly could potentially impact their life. Yep. And so you're really um, uncovering a really hidden issue that I that is in healthcare that we need to know about and is fascinating to me personally. So um, I will open it up for questions. And then if nobody else has any, I certainly always do. So may I ask anybody you'd like to unmute and just step in and ask a question to do so? No, no questions from, from the audience? Yeah, I got uh, two questions, Jacqueline, uh, okay. um, Charlie Navidian. Uh, number one, uh, to what extent is this solution integratable with other platforms? And number two, how do you charge for the service? Absolutely. Great question. Ted, you want, you want me to take that or you want to take it? Um, you're, yeah. You've got it. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, it's it, you asked the right question. The very first thing is how in integratable is it? The entire intent is to make, have this be fully integrated into into the systems that a that uh, for for any care system. So one of the biggest challenges, and I don't know if you're you intended to ask this, but this is a hot button for me. Um, the EMRs or EHRs are are notoriously difficult to sort of integrate with, and that was our whole objective: is to create this path in, fully integrated with with Epic and Cerner um, and, and the other other large um other large uh emr systems and so it, it is and what we did is we built that it's fully integrated with cerner at virginia mason we're in the process of fully integrating it with epic um and and uh what we will do is as we have clients that are coming on board that have other emrs that are that are they're sizable we'll go through and we look that as that's our product development cost um, so we'll develop those those integrations as, as time progresses. We look at, um, but that that's our that's our objective. We've actually in some of the the other uh, say competitors, I should say other other entities that are in the space, it's faster and easier to just have um, something that doesn't integrate that solves one piece of the process. But the, 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 the issue is in the we see we, we don't ever really want to deliver that solution because the real benefit comes from have a, having a fully integrated end to end solution. So the way we um, the way we built for it is um, if you're familiar with the space we uh, we don't take the technical fee or uh, or the clinicians we don't take the fees associated to it that's still up to the hospital system to go through their their typical billing for these these remote alerts. But what we do do is we charge um, a per patient fee on, on an annualized basis based on an approximation of how many patients they have under care. Um, and that is that is some typically some factor less than the technical fee. So we, we look at that and depending on what the agreement that's signed, um, we look at making sure that it's it's more favorable um, to the uh, to maybe some of the other entities that might take the entire technical fee, we find that um, charging less than that is is profitable for us and has a really fantastic ROI for for the clients. If I could just add on one thing to that, also, Kareem, the um, the integrations we have are also working with Virginia Mason right now, currently against their billing system, so um, it's possible to clear alert. Um, place those two bill codes against the alert, have it go out both to the physician for sign off and then from there right into the billing system and into the EMR. So, yeah. you know, all these activities, the activities that don't have major medical implementations are all sort of like one click and done. And then the medical, you know, the stuff where it's like, I have to think about this patient, then there's obviously deeper data, data and integration there. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question as well, if you can hear me. Um, yep. Awesome. 
Yeah, I was just wondering, and you may have already said this, but um, so is is the data that's going into the system, is that heart rate and cardiac rhythm, is there any other data that's being inputted? And then is the patient interfacing with that system at all, or is it just uh, coming from the data coming from the cardiac device and then directly transmitting to the patient's clinic, the cardiac clinic? Yeah, that's a great question. So the it's none of it right now is patient facing. And that's the thing that we've considered in terms of if we saw a lot of demand, or we saw that there was a lot of opportunity that to that, then we would look at making that actually um, consumer facing or patient facing. Um, the thing that um, is interesting, especially when looking at the CARES Act, you know, there is uh, potentially some real, there is a uh, some desirability to have that patient facing, um, you know, for us, you know, we're looking at, as we're looking at scaling this commercial uh, commercializing this, um, for us, that's not at the top of the roadmap, but it's something that we're definitely considering. Um, the other thing is too, just, uh, there are, um, we didn't actually go through this in great deal, but the, uh, a great deal, but there are four manufacturer websites that actually this information comes in and we aggregate that from these different webs into our sort of single source of truth platform. Um, so that's how it flows into our system. Um, but there are no other, there are no other um, systems. There's, well, actually uh, take that back. Um, there is a patient information system that we, that we either integrate with if you have one that's existing or you can rely on our, our patient in, uh, information system. So you can almost think of it like, let's call it a CIS, cardiological information system, right? Um, and we can either use an existing, we, in fact, we've, we integrated with uh, the Lumetics, uh, Lumetic Apollo uh, platform at, at Virginia Mason, but subsequently we've, we've developed our own, our own hub. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah. It would be interesting to see like if a patient could indicate like they're having chest pain or palpitations mm -hmm. or lightheaded or you know like that'd be interesting information but I understand that's a whole nother level of complexity for sure in consideration yeah yeah, yeah. And, and I saw just I, you know Jared you made a comment I'm paying attention to the chat too um there is there is opportunity there is opportunity there, right? This, this is, it's, you, you asked actually, so Nikki, you, you asked a really fantastic question because what this gets at is what's, if there is a centralized hub of information around, around patient information that does not exist in the EMR, the EHR, if it doesn't exist there, but it's actually a hub that's oriented around providing care, like understanding, you know, what's happening with the patient and how to action on that. That's really compelling and powerful. And that's that's the format that they, they've moved to in a lot of ways at Virginia Mason. And we're just one, what we've accomplished is one, let's call it one spoke on that wheel, right? But there are so much other opportunity to provide these hyper-efficient workflows based on that centralized data hub that we, we're not talking about that now, but the reality, and Jared, you're, you're getting at it. The, the reality is that it's there. And this is the evolution of, of data in healthcare, I believe. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. I actually, I know some people who have sort of fallen through the cracks in their doctor's offices and they're not the type of folks that you would think have, would have fallen through the cracks and, uh, you know, have trouble get, even just getting through to the doctor's office. So it's interesting, but thanks for this work and thanks for presenting. Absolutely. So we have time for one more great question. That was really excellent, Nikki. I, does anybody else have any other questions? I will ask if we just have a, a second left and there aren't questions. I would, I would like to hear if there was anything that you feel could have been more clear or anything that left you feeling like, yeah, I didn't really understand what you were getting at there. We tried to sort of straddle the line knowing this audience might be a mix of subject matter experts and people that are more lay people relative to this particular environment. Did it feel like it was the story easily understood uh, and, and uh, could you get what we're trying to accomplish? I, I certainly did, Karina. Okay. I, I did, but you know, I would like to maybe defer that to others because I've had the opportunity to meet with you a few times. Um, right. Nikki, did you have a follow-up? 
Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it was fairly clear, but I guess, um, you know, I wasn't sure about the patient facing part um, yeah. and, and what exactly data, if it was just the, it wasn't clear up front, if it was just the yeah. cardiac, the, the data coming from the cardiac device. Yeah. Um, yeah. And out of just like my own curiosity, but I, I don't wanna take up time, but like, I don't know if you can, without discussing anything proprietary, um, discuss a little bit more of like the, the AI um, and the algorithm that you're, and how you have set that up, just because I'm, I'm learning about it, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> Actually, you want to know the secret. This is, this is, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too. Um, so the AI is really rudimentary in that there's just basic information. We know things are, some things are more, if it's just a billing alert, that's just a billing alert. We don't need to prioritize that. Um, if, if it is something that has to do with, you know, that's potentially life-threatening, we prioritize that, right? We, we push that up. But the, the thing that's, it is, we're mindful of um, people referring to AI and the possibility of some very sophisticated machine learning or analytics tools that could exist are coming from the standpoint of a fancy data plumber. My thing is in 99 times out of 100, just being able to integrate to your systems so that you are not having any manual inter intervention is wildly more powerful than the sophistication of, of, of you know, a, 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 a very complicated algorithm. There, this is a very basic algorithm to prioritize and triage alerts that are coming in. And so while I would like to, and we, we have uh, an AI team ready to spin up and apply it to these data sets, it's just not the most important thing right now. We, we got a 10x improvement in terms of efficiency just by being able to have some very simple like the stack stack ranking. So it is, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks Jared. Um, it, it is, uh, it, it is I, I feel like uh, I'm compelled to say, yes, it's very complicated. You wouldn't understand it, um, but that's not the case. I guess that makes sense if you can tag which rhythms are more are life-threatening and which all right. Yeah. Uh, not so much. <laughs> uh, one, one, uh, one more question. Uh, does any aspect of this need FDA approval? Yeah. No. This is this is all within the existing uh, construct of the of the data that's actually being used. That's coming from the four manuf. In fact, it's coming from existing four manufacturers. And so, all we're doing is we are organizing information into a highly useful way. Good. Thank and you. there is. I mean, from an entrepreneurial perspective, the, that perspective, there's certainly something attractive about being in a space around medicine that doesn't involve all as much of the FDA oversight. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, our time to market is very, uh, if this were a device, yeah. you know, we would be talking to you guys at the end of the decade or something. So, <laughs> so, um, so Charlie, I, I'm going to out Charlie a little bit. So Charlie knows this well. So he is a, a medical device and he's a, a previous presenter. And if Charlie, if you'd like to connect with Ted and with Kareem afterwards, I'm happy to share that. So, but he's got some, he's got something pretty exciting that he's working on and he's got some real expertise too. Oh, so, Excellent. Uh, yeah. So I, I noted their email addresses and I put mine in the chat. So okay. we, we will connect. Very good. Perfect. Awesome. Very good. So Super. I want to thank you all. Um, I, we are running a little bit over, but I want to stop here and just ask what, what else can we do for you, Ted and Karim? What else can this community do as you grow this idea and save lives? Ted, you start. I've got one thing I'm going to close with. Oh, you want? Oh, great. Well, I mean, we just, we appreciate, um, it, at the most base level, we appreciate practice and telling our story. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, and obviously, as you are in your world and finding co cardiological overlap, we're, you know, we're in an expansion mode. We're looking for, um, I mean, we're in deep in contract conversations with our second client. We'd like to be building to, you know, multiple clients in the course of the next 18 months. So. Um, if there are clinics in Alaska or elsewhere you, where you feel like there's an introduction that would be appropriate, we would we would love to have conversations. 
Awesome. The fact that you're already in Sitka and Juneau is huge. So I think that that makes a good case for other uh, you know, businesses that are here, other clinics that are here. So thank you. So I want to thank you all very much for attending. Fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for coming here today. We will follow you just like we've stayed connected to Charlie and um, we'll absolutely support you as you move forward. Now, everyone, um, our next presentation is on March 10th. It's with uh, Alaska Natural Burials. So it's actually a, a woman here in Alaska who's trying to build a green cemetery. So please join us on March 10th. Um, she could really use your ideas and your support. Um, I promised to tell you about uh, Dr. Um, uh, Ping Lan, who's up in Fairbanks, who's developing a robot to help elders in their homes. And uh, I put that information in the newsletter, but he's making good progress. He has already submitted a phase one SBIR proposal, and he was actually invited to submit a second one. And he was so busy that he couldn't. So he's put that off till next year. But I firmly believe that we will see something amazing from him. So that's all for this Health Tie Open Innovation. Thank you again for attending. And uh, Ted and Kareem, thank you again. And I will follow up and um, have an awesome day, everyone. Thank you much for very much for coming. Great. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Sure. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Thank you for coming. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much. I really Thanks, Jacqueline. It. Yep. Okay. All right. Very much appreciate it. Be well. Okay. I'll follow up. All right. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Goodbye now.